Didn't sound quite right with his Texas accent, but huidach. <laughs> Yesterday I shared with you and those who were here how the Lord changed my life when he taught me to pray his word back to him and confess it over my life. And he helped me overcome the identity crisis. It was in 1995 that he first, when I was terribly ill, that the Lord taught me to claim his promises, to pray them back to him. And in 1996, it was late 1995, in 1996 he healed me, and this became a practice of my life, is to get into the Bible and claim his promises. But before we want get into this message today, I wanted to share with you how this message came about. Because what happened after about 18 months of claiming God's promises, confessing it over my life as affirmations, and drawing so near to the Lord that I could feel his heart beat, then I t ended up accepting a job out of town as a consultant, and this consultant position ended up being 24-7 um, practically. I was working seven days a week, literally. I was traveling, so obviously I couldn't go to church. I was not yet an Adventist, but I couldn't go to church, and I made a deal with the Lord. I told God, Father, this is only for a show short period of time. Have you ever made a deal with God? It's only for a short period of time that I'm going to do this. And I continued to pray and I continued to be in the Word. But the harder I worked and concentrated on my work, the more I began to backslide. And at, at the end of about an 18-month period, two-year period with this company, I was once again in our hometown and I was miserable because there was a barrier between me and God. And I said to the Lord over and over in my prayer, what's wrong with me, Lord? Can I get a witness? What's wrong with me, Lord? How is it that I can walk so close to you that I feel your heartbeat and then find myself sliding back from you? It is just an amazing thing how quickly we can lose our rhythm of relationship. And any time that we have negligence of prayer and misplaced priorities, that is a sign of an unsurrendered life. So one morning, we were living in Coleman, Texas, out in the middle of nowhere. One morning, I got up. And we lived 200 miles from any large towns, but about 60 miles away from me was a Sam's Club, like a Costco or a pay and play or pay and play? Pick and play. Pick and pay. Justin got me all messed up. He kept calling it pick and play. Pick and pay. I thought it couldn't be play. But anyway, so. I, I had to drive 60 miles, and I'd go once a month and stock up and bring things back. And on the way, in the car, how many of you use the car as a prayer closet? Anybody in here? When I get in the car, I don't turn on the radio. I don't want the noise and the distractions. It's quite often, it's a time that it's just like, <gasps> I've got some quiet time. And I like to pray when I'm in the car. But on the way to Sam's Club in Abilene, Texas, I was praying so earnestly with the Lord. And I kept saying to him, Father, I don't understand how this happens to me. It's happened in the past. Lord, you've got to show me the way out of this. How I'm tired of three steps forward, two steps back. Lord, I want it to be a consistent relationship with you. And I am just praying and going down the road and I get to Sam's Club I still have no resolution but I agree the Lord and I made an agreement and I said father I'm going in to do my shopping and when I come back out we'll continue this prayer so I was a woman on a mission 
when I went into Sam's Club. I got my shopping done quickly, came out, put my parcels in the car, and I headed back. And as soon as I hit the road, I was praying again. Well, I had 60 miles, an hour's drive to pray. And I am praying fervently for about 30 minutes. And suddenly, the still, small voice of the Lord, you know what I'm talking about, 1 Kings 19, 12, that still, small voice of the Lord, as I'm going down the road, and I said, Father, please, you have to show me. How can I overcome this? How can I draw near to you? I'm tired of backsliding, Lord. And suddenly what I heard in my mind, not audible words, but this is what I heard. Child, I promise you, if you will begin each day with an hour in prayer with me, you will never backslide again. Well, <laughs> I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, an hour a day? Lord, there's times that I've prayed for extended periods of time, but I thought, how can I pray an hour a day every day? Wouldn't it become repetitive? Wouldn't it be, you know, and I'm just reasoning with the Lord and going down the road, and I'm, now I'm kind of arguing with God, and I said, Lord, I know myself. I'm not that disciplined. I can't promise you that I'm going to be begin each day with an hour of prayer. Well, Lord, it would have to be you. In the United States, the teenagers have a very rude saying or crude saying. When something is obvious, they'll go, well, duh. Do you do that over here? Oh, bad manners go everywhere, huh? And it, but that was one of those duh moments. Of course it would have to be God. John 15, 5, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. So I drove on back, and I, as I parked the car, I mean, I was silent then. I was kind of in stunned silence. I parked the car, and I said, all right, Lord, I will I make an agreement with you. I'll pray an hour each day if you'll get me up and get me into that prayer time. So the next morning, I got up at my usual hour, which was 5 o'clock in the morning, and I decided, well, I better fix some breakfast so that my stomach wouldn't be rumbling while I was praying. And then, being an obsessive housekeeper, I had to tidy up the kitchen, take out the trash, make the bed. You know, Lynn, if, if you're a perfectionist, you're a perfectionist, right? And I watched the morning news. That was my habit. And then I thought, well, maybe I ought to go take a shower and get ready for the day before I pray so I'll be a bright-eyed and bushy-tailed prayer, prayer warrior, right? And when I was in the shower, it just washed over me that my habit of procrastination had kicked in. And so I quickly readied myself. I grabbed my Bible, and I went downstairs, and I found my favorite seat because I figured if I was going to pray for an hour, um, I've got some back problems, and I thought I, I won't be able to sit on my knee or stand on my knees for an hour. So I sat there, and just the Bible fell open. And I said, Lord... I remembered what the psalmist said in Psalm 27, verse 7 through 9. David said, When you said to me, seek my face, I said, Lord, your face I will seek. So I said, Lord, I don't know what you want me to do to pray for an hour. You're going to have to teach me how to pray. But I'm here to seek your face. So teach me. I was strongly impressed that I should journal my prayers. And so I thought about that for a moment, and my handwriting, when I'm writing fast, it's just chicken scratching. It's worse than a doctor's. It's like hieroglyphics. Sometimes I can't even read. If I write a quick note, and I go to the market, and it's like, what is this? So I, I thought, well, Lord, is it okay if I go to my computer and type my prayer? What do you think God, God would think about that? You know what? God doesn't care if you're going to spend an hour. He doesn't care how you're spending it with him. And, and so I went to the computer to type my prayer. And the interesting thing was, I'm, I'm sitting there. I open up a file. I put the date at the top of it. And I said, Lord, where do I begin? He led me in a prayer process 
that was really interesting. And I labeled each segment, not the first day, I think it was about the third day that I was praying like this, that I labeled each segment. And it, and it actually was an acronym for praise. Because it began with praise, the second segment was repentance, then affirmations, then intercession, then supplication, then the last segment was enter and be still. And what we're going to do, I've written an entire book on this. I don't know why I try to teach a whole book in about a 50-minute slot here, but I'm going to just take you through this because here's what I want to be sure and say up, up front. This is only one type of prayer. I'm always leery about prayer, quote-unquote, formulas. And I don't really look at this as a formula. It is just various segments. But there's many, many types of prayer. God doesn't command us to pray an hour each day, but I will guarantee you, as long as for 10 years every day, this was 1999, for 10 years every day, I got up and spent a minimum of an hour a day in prayer with the Lord. God totally changed my life. This is how God called me into full-time ministry. This, God totally changed my life through praying like this. But I must also say, it isn't something that you have to journal. Has anyone in here ever tried journaling your prayers? I don't mean just your requests, but actually writing it out like it's a letter to the Lord. You know what's the amazing thing about this? Now, you don't have to journal to pray like this. If J.D. Quinn is a man of prayer, this man prays 24-7. If he's awake, he's praying. And if I were to tell my precious husband, J.D. Quinn, that he had to journal his prayers, he may never pray again. You know, So you don't have to journal your prayers to pray like this. But let me show you what is interesting about journaling. How many of you are like this? You're on your knees and you begin to pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you and you begin and you're praying. Oh, my goodness, do I need to go to the market today? Um, Father, excuse me. Uh, and Lord, thank you, Father. And oh, David called last night. I forgot to return his call. Oh, excuse me, Father. Okay. Does that sound familiar? The nice thing about journaling, whoops, I'm on my skirt. The nice thing about journaling is it involves all of your senses. And it makes you focus. And the more focused you are in prayer, the more intimate it becomes. So that's just my little advertisement for journaling, but it's not necessary. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do come in the name of Jesus. And Lord, as we go through this, I ask that you will teach us and impress upon us, Lord, the importance of Prayer. Father, prayer is the breath of the soul, and it is the way that we communicate with you. And Lord, we don't want to just constantly be seeking your hand, Lord, to move, but rather we want to seek your face. So teach us today in Jesus' name. Amen. I call this type of prayer pressing into God's presence. And it began as I sat there and said, Lord, where do I begin? What came to my mind was Psalms 100 and verse 4. And in Psalms 100 verse 4, it says, We will enter your gates with thanksgiving in our heart and enter your courts with praise. So that is what the Lord impressed me to do. And I began to give thanksgiving. You know, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2.9, that we are a royal generation, a chosen people, and we were chosen to proclaim the praises of God. So as I began thanking God for everything that he was doing in my life, I thanked him for Jesus Christ, the gift of salvation, for the Holy Spirit, for the Word, thanking him for my wonderful husband. You know what? I think the reason that they entered the gates with thanksgiving is because you can't have a pity party when you are being in an attitude of thanksgiving. 
Some of us come to the Lord and it is, woe is me, my arthritis in my knees is killing me, when someone else can't even walk. You know, um, Pastor Brandon Pratt had an illness uh, that it was a, um, hmm, what do you call it, immune system, myelitis, and it attacked his spinal cord. He couldn't move for like six months. And he said he never knew what a blessing it was just to be able to walk. So when we come before the Lord, if we've got this self-pitying, moaning attitude, once you start listing out all the reasons you have to be thankful, it changes your prayer posture, if you will. And then we begin to praise the Lord. Turn to Psalm 103, if you will, please. There, if you can't think of how to praise the Lord, let me give you some, some of, something to be thankful for. Psalm 103. This is a psalm of David, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 6. Psalm 103, David says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. When you're finding, if you're coming before the Lord and you're praising him for his forgiveness, for his healing in your life, that he has redeemed you, that he has crowned you with loving kindness and satisfies you with his goodness and executes righteousness and justice. And you begin to praise him. Thanksgiving is what God's doing in your life. Praise is thanking him for who he is, for his character. Why does God want us and command us to praise him? Does praise change God? No. Praise changes us. And our entire prayer posture will be changed because our attitude is changed. We are invited to come boldly before the throne of grace, but we are also to come humbly before the throne of grace. And when we begin to be thankful and then to praise him for the loving God that he is, all-powerful, all-righteous, all-holy, it changes our prayer posture, and it is faith-building. Psalm 22, verse 3 says that God inhabits the praises of his people. The next segment that the Lord led me as I finished my praise was repentance. Why? You're in Psalms. Turn to Psalm 24. Let's look. Psalm 24, verse 3. Psalm 24, verse 3. Again, a psalm of David. And he says in verse 3, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Now turn to Psalm 66, if you will, please. Psalm 66. Let's look at verse 18. This psalm says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, what's going to happen? The Lord will not hear. Did you know, well, we don't have time today to go into this, but each one of these prayer segments, the Lord led later, as, as he taught me to pray like this, he did change my life. I did know he was calling me to full-time ministry within just a few months. 
And afterwards, he took me on a study of the sanctuary. Each one of these segments lines up perfectly with the sanctuary. The praise was entering the gates with thanksgiving and, and uh, praise, entering his courts with praise. But what was the first th item that they would see when they entered into the sanctuary? There was the altar, the brazen altar of burnt offerings. And then what did they see? The laver. And did you know that the priest, before they could enter into, remember, we're pressing into the presence of the Lord, seeking his face. Before they could enter into the holy place, this, this labor, it was a, um, an urn-shaped thing that had a saucer around it, and it was made from the bronze of the mirrors. It was very fine bronze of the mirrors that the women had brought out of Egypt. And they had donated it. It was beaten down. And it was like a reflection pool. And before the priest could enter into the holy place, they had to be perfectly clean. They washed their hands. They washed their face. They washed their feet. If there was a spot on their garment, they had to be cleansed to go and press into the presence of the Lord. How much more should we? So repentance if we regard iniquity in our heart, God will not hear. Let me quickly give you five steps to repentance. Number one is recognition of sin. I ask and pray, Lord, if I'm doing anything that is not according to your will, please show me. Second is godly sorrow. 2 Corinthians 7.10. He says that worldly sorrow brings death, but godly sorrow brings repentance. It produces repentance. The third step is confession. 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of what? All unrighteousness. And then this next step is to receive God's forgiveness. You know, some of us pray for forgiveness for the same thing over and over again. And you know, the Bible says that once we have asked God, let me see if I can find this scripture because I don't have it in here. But once we have prayed and asked God for forgiveness, I believe it's 1 Kings 14, 8. Let me see. Yes. Once, turn to 1 Kings 14, 8. Once we have prayed and asked God for forgiveness, did you know that God forgets what we ask him to forgive? Look at this. I, I just nearly did handsprings when I found this scripture. Let me set it up. God was talking to the prophet, and he told him to, go to, to give this message for King, uh, the prophet Ahisha. He was supposed to give this message to King Jeroboam. And look at verse 8. He's saying to him, you tell this king, that I tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you, King Jeroboam. And yet you've not been as my servant David who kept my commandments and who followed me with all of his heart to do only what was right in my eyes. David is dead and buried. Did David do only what was right in God's eyes? He was guilty of murder, guilty of adultery. He was guilty of disobeying God. You break one commandment, you break them all. So how could God say David did only what was right in my eyes? He kept all my commandments. That proves to me, God forgets what we ask him to forgive. When David, if you just jot this down, go to Psalm 51. We're not going to turn there now. But if you want to learn how to receive God's forgiveness, Psalm 51 is the prayer of repentance after David's affair with Bathsheba after he did away with her husband, and he goes before the Lord and says, wash me thoroughly and repeatedly. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. 
Don't take your Holy Spirit from me, Lord. I'm here. So we need to receive God's forgiveness. And only when you receive God's forgiveness will you be able to complete the act of repentance, which is to change your conduct. If you don't change your conduct, you haven't repented. Because repentance means to turn around. It's like you're headed this way in some area and God helps you recognize your sin. You pray for forgiveness and then by his power, he turns you back and puts you on the right path. Acts 5.31 said that Jesus was given to us that he might grant forgiveness of sins and grant us repentance. Repentance is a gift. So make that a joyful part of of your prayer. You should be joyful. Repentance is a joyful act because God is restoring you, blotting out your sin and sending a refreshing from his presence. So then as I was praying here, I had entered with praise and repentance. Then I'm asking the Lord, now what? If you were to walk into the holy place, The first item of furniture that you would see on your right is what? The table of showbread. And this showbread, Jesus Christ is the living bread. He is the bread of life, the living word. And what is our manna from heaven? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. So this is where affirmations came in. And just like the priest would set out the fresh showbread, each day I would pray God's promises back to him. Remember, how many of you were here yesterday? Well, not everybody, so let me just say this. In Hebrews 1.3, the Bible says that God sustains us, upholds us, maintains us, propels us, that Christ does, by his mighty word of power. There is transforming power in the word of God. And what the Lord taught me to do when I mentioned affirmations, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 1.20 that if anyone is in Christ, how many promises of God are ours? All of God's promises are ours in Christ Jesus. And when I, when the Lord first taught me to take his word, to pray it back to him, to confess it over my life, is when I was extremely ill. I had vertigo, a condition where you feel like your, your environment is twirling, and mine was 24-7 for a full year. I know it was unrelenting. I never had a break from it. So God had taught me to take his promises, to pray them over my life, to confess them back to him. And I'll tell you, the first two weeks that I did this, I thought, am I crazy? Did the Lord really tell me to do this? And I'd say, Lord, where's my faith? You know, I mean, there was no faith in this process. And God led me to three scriptures. We won't look them up, but just jot these down. Isaiah 55, verse 11. Isaiah 55, verse 11. God says, My word that goes forth from my mouth shall not return to me void, but shall accomplish every purpose for which I sent it. So as you begin to pray God's word back to him, you're returning the word of God to him. And it's not going to return without power. Then he led me to Jeremiah 1.12, where he told the prophet in Jeremiah 1.12, you have seen correctly, for I, God, am watching over my word to perform it. You know, I, I am absolutely convinced that God is waiting for his people to have enough faith to get into the Bible, to take his promises, to pray them back to him, to confess them over their life as a matter of testimony, saying this is who I am in Christ Jesus. As a new creation in Christ, this is who I am. 
And as soon as we return his word like that, he's watching over, over it to perform it. But God also led me to Romans 4, 17, which says that he is the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they already were. See, God knows the end from the beginning. Isaiah 46, 10, he says, I know the end from the beginning. And you can know it too because it is written. So this is a very important part of prayer, is to pray God's word back to him. Much of what you pray will seem almost impossible when you first start claiming God's promises and confessing them over your life. It will seem next to impossible. But let me tell you something. Don't exalt your opinion above God's word. God says in Psalm 138, verse 2, the Bible says that God exalts all things, his name and his word above all things, and his name, excuse me, his word he magnifies above his name. Why? Why is the word of God so important to God? Because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ, the living Word, is hit the mind of Christ right here. Right here. You can pray with the mind of Christ when you take God's promises and pray them back to Him and confess them over your life. But I do want you to turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Because I think that there's nothing more important that we can learn to do as Christians if we want to overcome this identity crisis that we have, not knowing who we are in Christ Jesus. We need to do more than come to the word for head knowledge, we need to get the word planted in our heart. In 2 Peter chapter 1, let's look at verse 3. Now let's start with 2. Grace, grace, which is supernatural power and divine assistance, the unmerited favor and supernatural power of God. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Everything that you need for a godly life, for an abundant life, is available to you if you will tap into God's grace pipeline. How through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which, by his glory and virtue, have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these, through what? Through his promises, you may become partakers of the divine nature. You partake of Christ's divine, the living word, his divine nature as you partake of his written word. And... It says also it will help you escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. So there is nothing, J.D. has a way of saying it. Um, when we make affirmations from God's word, it is something that we are confirming God's word. And we're saying, Lord, we believe what you're saying. And J.D. said to me one day, you know, it's kind of like if a parent is watching, you know, a parent, you're telling your child every day, don't go up climbing up in the hills there where the black mambos are. And one day your child is outside playing and all the little kids are saying, let's go up here in the hills where all the black mambos are. And you hear your child say, no, my daddy said it's not safe to be in the black, with the black mambos up in those hills. How do you feel as a parent when your child says this? Aren't you pleased that they have received your word, they've accepted your word, and they're putting your word into practice? That's what affirmations are like. We've got to let God know we believe. And quickly moving on, we went from praise to 
the repentance, now affirmations, then what in the holy place, what is right before the veil? The altar of incense, which represented prayer and intercessory prayer. So intercession is the next segment of the prayer that God taught me. And this is interesting because usually we pray for ourselves first, then we pray for others later, don't we? And something even more interesting, when the Lord started me te teaching me to pray, he showed me or taught me, led me in this way. He had me praying for world situations first, and then it came, it just kept coming into smaller circles, began to then pray for the world church, for my home church, for my extended family, my immediate family, and finally it came down to where I was praying for my precious husband, J.D. I think there was a, a, a really good reason in that, and I'm going to share it with you in just a moment. But what I want to impress upon you is this. I had a little old lady who called, and I say little old lady, she was about 96 years old. She was a missionary's wife. She had been in the mission field for many years, and now she was in a nursing home, and she called me one day. And I don't get a chance to take most of the calls that come in to me at 3 ABN. I don't have a secretary. And I get mounds of mail that I don't get to even answer, and mounds of phone calls just because you're on television, right? People think it's, they want you to pray with you most of the time. But my job is program development manager. So I don't always get to receive the calls. I usually let them go into voicemail, and if it's a prayer request, I send it on to pastoral department. But one day I was impressed to pick up the phone. And this little lady said to me, Oh, honey, I just don't really have a ministry anymore. But I'm just calling to tell you how special 3ABN is to us. And she said, I want you to know I pray for you all every day. I pray for you, I pray for J.D., I pray for Danny, I pray for you all by name. And I said, really, every day? And she said, yes. As a matter of fact, I spend most of my day praying. And I said, congratulations. You have now graduated to the highest level of ministry. And she said, what? And I said, absolutely. Intercessory prayer is the greatest ministry there is. Let me give you a scripture to back that up. Hebrews 7.25 says that Jesus Christ, our risen and exalted Savior, stands at the right hand of the throne of God, interceding on our behalf, and he is able to save to the uttermost. If that is the ministry of our risen and exalted Savior, can you think of a greater ministry than intercessory prayer? I don't think there is one. See, we don't realize that when I prayed for my sister who was a drug addict for 15 years, she wasn't praying for herself. She was on heroin and cocaine. It, she wasn't praying for herself. And you know what? God doesn't force his way into anyone's life, does he? But a loving God puts like his own self-imposed handcuffs and says, oh, I want to help that child, but they won't let me help them. They won't even call on me. Oh, but mama's calling. She's calling for her baby girl. And so mama's prayer is like the key that unlocks those handcuffs and gives God permission to work in her life. So as I was praying for my sister, oh, Lord, put a hedge of protection around her. Lord, open her eyes, turn her from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to you, oh, Father, that she might receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me, Jesus Christ. You know what? God protected her. She should have been dead so many times. That was the greatest thing I could do for my sister was to pray for her. We need to be more active in intercessory prayer. In Ezekiel 22 and verse 30, the Lord said that he was looking for someone who would stand in the gap. And he could find nobody. But turn to Isaiah chapter 59. Because if you really want to see how God feels about the lack of intercessory prayer, just turn to Isaiah chapter 59. 
Isaiah 59. Let's look at verse 16. When you're there, say amen. All right. The Bible says, let's, look at, let's start with verse 16. We'll go ahead. He saw, he being the Lord, the previous scripture just said the Lord saw, it displeased him, that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. What did God wonder? God wondered, one, why no one loved the people enough to pray for them. And the second thing he wondered is why no one had enough faith to believe prayer would make a difference. That he could make a difference. We need to intercede and turn to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 12, 23. Because this is so important. 1 Samuel 23. Excuse me, 1 Samuel 12, 23. <laughs> I knew that wasn't right. 1 Samuel 12 and verse 23. Samuel's writing and he says, Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against whom? Sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. Are we really spending enough time in intercessory prayer? I can tell you that I know I'm not. I go through seasons where I'm really doing well. But we need to spend more time in intercessory prayer. So as the Lord continued, and I believe the reason, I don't want to forget this, I think the reason is God was teaching me to pray like this in intercession here I began, you know, with the, with the world, the world church, and it kept coming down into a more intimate, tight-knit circle until I reached praying for J.D. I think he did this to make it more intimate because the next segment of the prayer was supplication. And this was getting where it is personal for me. Supplication. That is a word, actually, that can be used for intercessory prayer is always when you're praying for others supplication could be a prayer for others but most generally it is used as a prayer for self when jesus was in the garden he made supplication for himself it, and david uses the word frequently as supplication the most important thing that you can pray for yourself every morning is that you will walk in surrender to the power of God that day. To pray and say, Lord, Luke 12, 42, as Jesus said, 22, 42, Luke 22, 42, as Jesus said, Father, not my will, but yours be done in my life today. Lord, as he said in Luke 9, 23, help me to pick up my cross today and to be crucified to self by the power of your Holy Spirit. He tells us in Romans 8, 13, that those who live by the flesh will die, but those who by the Spirit put to death the misdeeds of the flesh will live. So we need to pray that. Be like Paul who said in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I die daily. And as we pray that, that we will be crucified to the world and the world to us, we need to ask for the Holy Spirit. In Luke 11, verse 9, Jesus said to ask, to seek, to knock. And how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is a continuous action. It's keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking every day. You should get up and say to the Lord, Lord, 
when you are praying for yourself, Father, help me to pick up my cross and die to self, be emptied of self, and be filled with your Holy Spirit. And sometimes it's hour by hour. When I was writing Exalting His Word, I only had 17 days to write that book from start to finish. And I told my sister, who called me, I was running the ministry out of my home at the time, and I told my sister, who called me four or five times a day, that I could not do that while I was writing. I said, we'll talk once a day, let's talk at 5 o'clock, and don't call me unless it's an emergency. So I would get up in the morning and spend a couple hours in prayer, then I'd begin writing. And I would be so surrendered to the Lord, and I'd get a phone call. And I'd look. Uh, obviously, I was monitoring my calls at this point because I'm writing. And it would be her, and I'd think, it must be an emergency. And I'd pick it up, and I'd say, what's wrong? Oh, nothing. I just missed you. I felt like talking. And I'd say, I can't talk. I, I told you I couldn't, so bye. A few hours later, the phone would ring, and I'd pick it up. And I'd say, what's wrong? Oh, I just missed you. So about the fourth time this happened, I pick up the phone, and I said, I told you, honey, I can't talk. And she said, fine, I don't have a sister anymore. Just don't bother calling me anymore. And she says, you don't love me. And I want you to know my flesh reared its ugly head. And I said, I don't love you. You don't respect me. And nyah, 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 nyah. I gave her a good chewing out. I hung up the phone, went back to my writing, wrote for about an hour. It was biblically correct. It was scripturally correct. There was no anointing in the writing. I had quenched the Holy Spirit of God. I had to tear it up. I had to pray again to surrender. And then I could get on with God's business. It is so critical that we remember, Jesus said in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. You cannot live a Christian life in your own power. It has to be with the Lord. Then the final, of course, supplication is where you're putting all of your personal requests now before the Lord. And then... The first day that I was writing this, how much time do I have left? How much? 12 minutes? Thank you. Well, they're, they're taping this, though. They're taping this, so that's why I'm kind of hurriedly going along. But here's what happened the first day that I was praying. I'd been through praise, repentance, affirmations, intercession, supplication, I had covered the clock when I got upstairs at my computer. You know, and the reason I was, I was typing my prayer, I, I type over 100 words a minute. So, I mean, boy, I was just flying. And I'd covered the clock with a sticky note because I knew I'd be tempted to look. So, I'm thinking at this point, I'm kind of running out of steam. Lord, what's next? And there's nothing coming. So, I'm thinking, okay. I felt maybe 40 minutes had passed, and I peeked under the sticky note. I had started praying at 8 o'clock in the morning, and it was now 10.15. I'd prayed for 2 hours and 15 minutes, and it just seemed such a short period of time. And it was like, wow, Lord. And so now I'm getting ready to type out, in Jesus' name, amen. But before I could touch the amen, here's what I heard. Be still and know that I am God. Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. How many of you know that you know that you know you've heard the still, small voice of the Lord, that God, by the power of his Holy Spirit, has impressed his thoughts upon your mind sometime in your life? Let me see your hands. Most of you. Now, a lot of you who didn't raise your hand are afraid to because you're thinking... This is going to be a trick. Do we believe that God still speaks to his people today? You know why we don't hear from him more often? Because we're not still before him. We are so busy making prayer a one-way communication, most of us going and just seeking God's hand for this and this and this and that. We don't press into his presence. And, and by the way, if we were in the sanctuary, 
when we are praying for the Holy Spirit, what is over here? We've got the seven-branched candlestick and the oil that's going to light up our lamps. But Jesus Christ, his crucifixion, opened a new and living way. It tore the veil and gave us the way into the presence of God. But we need to learn to be still before the Lord and listen for his still, small voice. Now, I have to tell you, you know, 1 Kings 19, 12 is the scripture that I'm referring to with the, the still, small voice. When we are seeking the face of the Lord, does it make any sense that we would seek his face and then not listen to what he might have to say? But it makes us nervous to think that God's speaking to us. Anytime somebody tells me, well, God said such and such to me, a little red flag comes up, and I'm going to really pay attention, see if it is scriptural, see if they are off the wall. I mean, there's a lot of people running around thinking God's speaking to them, and it's not the Lord. I had a lady come up to me at one meeting, and she said, oh, I was praying last night, and the Lord told me that I could I could divorce my husband. And I said, oh, I said, I'm so sorry. Is he having an affair? No. Was he abusive? No. And I said, well, what's wrong? She said, oh, he's just a lazy, no good thing. that just sits around on the couch too much. And I said, sister, you may think that's God's voice speaking, but the Bible would tell us otherwise, right? So as, as I am now... You know, I always, if somebody tells me that, I'm going to make sure the Holy Spirit of God, and I believe that's what his still small voice is, is when the Holy Spirit impresses his thoughts upon our mind. But the Holy Spirit of God will never, never tell us anything that doesn't line up in perfect agreement with this word. Never, ever. And when the Lord first, that first day when he said, be still, you know, I'm sitting there and a thought came to my mind and I'm thinking, is this you or is this me, Lord? Is this you or is this me, Lord? I must have said that a dozen times. Is this you or is this me, Lord? And he finally said, I will teach you to quit interrupting in the physical realm, the spiritual realm, as well as in the physical realm. And a thought came, and I wrote it out. And I have to tell you, I've got 10 years of prayer this segment's called Enter and Be Still. In those 10 years of time, when the Lord has spoken, impressed his thoughts upon my mind, there's been times it's one or two sentences. Sometimes it might be a paragraph. It hasn't been some big prophetic word. I know it's the voice of the Lord because when I come to him thinking that I am doing a really good job, he'll give me a word of correction. As a matter of fact, I pray for his correction. Do you? You may as well. He's going to discipline you, and if you are ready to receive it, he'll discipline you just with a look, a soft little whisper. If you ignore it, he's going to have to get louder and louder, and there will be consequences. But as I am praying, and sometimes I think I'm doing so well, he gives me a word of correction. Sometimes I think I'm just... I bottomed out, and God gives me a word of encouragement. But this is how I knew that he was calling me to full-time ministry. And here we were, after I'd worked for this company, J.D. and I had just started our own business. We had hundreds of CPAs around the United States ready for us to come and give business seminars to their clients. They said we could charge $1,000 for a weekend, a two-day weekend seminar, per client. And they were all guaranteeing us that they would have at least 100 clients at each seminar. 100 times 1,000 is 100,000 for a two-day seminar. Now, that's pretty good money. We needed it. And God's calling me to full-time ministry. And so what happens is... We're, we're, I'm still putting together all the PowerPoint presentations. We've got the big screen. We're putting everything, getting reservations. And J.D. was working out of town, and I went to visit him. And he said to me, we're driving down the road. He said, honey, what is wrong with you? And I said, what do you mean? He said, you were so excited about this business. And suddenly now, you just don't seem that enthusiastic. And he said, honey, if you could be doing anything in the world, what would you want to be doing? 
And I said, I wouldn't be out teaching people how to be more profitable in their business. I would be teaching them how to have a closer relationship with the Lord. And I said, honey, I know God's calling me to full-time ministry. I just don't know if it's now or, or maybe I could start part-time and then work into full-time. And he said, you do know. Because by this time, J.D. was convinced I was hearing from the Lord. The first time I told him God said something to me, I told him several days in a row, and finally one day he said, Honey, do me a favor. And I said, What's that? And he said, Don't tell anybody God's talking to you. They'll think you're nuts. <laughs> but by now he was convinced that, God, that I was hearing from God because I was being still before him. So what happened was, God told me that it had to be his decision, so I wasn't lying. I didn't know if it was going to be part-time than full-time because I didn't expect him to give up. We had invested so much to kick off this new business, and it was going to be so lucrative, and we needed it. I didn't expect him to just say, okay. So when he said to me, you do know, and I said, yes, I believe God's calling me to full-time ministry right now. And he said, who am I to argue with God? And the Lord graciously granted us a sign. The very next day, I was called to be with a big broadcasting network. They'd gotten a hold of a book I'd written, and they called me to Christian Network, and they offered me a program just right away, right after I accepted. But here's the thing I want to tell you, because my time's running out. The day after... J.D. and I had made the decision to go into full-time ministry. I drove home, and that next morning when I got up, I was praying, pressing into his presence through praise, repentance, affirmation, intercession, supplication, and then enter and be still. And as I was still before the Lord, here's what he said to me. This is all he said to me. Always before... You have put your hand to the plow and turn back. But not this time, for I will cup my hand over yours. I had been enrolled in ministry school, seminary before, and through a bunch of reasons, it ne I mean, tragic things would happen. It was like the devil was on the attack. But now I knew We'd made the right decision. God was going to cup his hand over mine. And we needed that because the next few years were difficult. Because now I was not working. J.D. was having to, to do, we were relying on one income, and we had a great business debt. So God is so gracious. Jesus said in Matthew 26, verse 40 and 41, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26. Let's do turn there. This is our last, last scripture. Matthew 26. When we pray, give me the Bible, we need to learn that the word is a very important part of our prayer life as well. Matthew 26, verse 40. Jesus said, he's in the, in the garden. He's asked his inner circle to stay there with him and pray, and he went on to pray. And he comes back and finds Peter, James, and John sleeping. It says, then he came, verse 40, Matthew 26. He came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, what, could you not watch with me one hour? You know, I used to think it was, what, could you not watch with me an hour? But no, in the Greek, it's a very tender thing that he said. What? Not even an hour you could pray with me. He says, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. I am here to commend to you today this practice. And I confess freely before you with a degree of guilt that I am not making a daily practice of this right now. I've allowed my schedule to become much, much too busy. If you can't do it every day, try doing it every Sabbath. I guarantee you, when you taste and see what a difference this makes in your life, you'll want to do it every day. And I 
am intending, by God's grace, to correct my um, lapse of doing this. Because when you pray like this, when God said you will never backslide again, I guarantee you, you can't backslide. Because if you even, by the end of the course of the day, if you're kind of a little off course, you get up the next morning and spend an hour in prayer with the Lord, and you'll find He corrects your course so rapidly that it's all about learning to press into His presence, to seek God's face and not just His hand. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again we come before you in the name of Jesus to thank you, Lord, for your word, to thank you. Lord, your way is in the sanctuary, and you've shown us a, a perfect and wonderful way to pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ and your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your word, O oh Lord. We praise you for who you are, Father God. We praise you and thank you for your love. Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus, forgive us that we are not the people of prayer we should be. Forgive us in particular, Lord, that we have not been interceding as we should be. Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus, you will grant us repentance. And we just claim, Father, that your power will be made perfect in our weakness and that you will be the one to will and to do your good pleasure within us. So, Father, we thank you. And we pray for all my brothers and sisters, Lord, that this will be a teaching that they can put into practice. I pray that for myself as well. Thank you, Father God, for all of your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.